have your Bibles with you this morning, uh, go ahead and grab them and turn with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Uh, if you are visiting with us or you don't have a copy of the Word of God, there should be one in the pew in front of you there. We would certainly encourage you to go ahead and grab that and follow along. As a faith family, we have been working our way through the Gospel of John, uh, nearing the end of this chapter. However, uh, we have spent a good deal of time here. Some of you are probably thinking we are still in John chapter 6. Uh, it's been several weeks and uh, we have spent a lot of time on this passage because the Word of God spends a lot of time on this passage. Right? There's 71 verses. It's filled with truth. And so we don't want to just blow through that and miss what the Lord has for us in his word. And so we have spent a lot of time focusing in particular on this idea that Jesus is the bread of life. And we're going to see that again this morning. And we're going to dive deeper into what that means for us uh, and certainly does well to prepare our hearts as we gather around his table this morning. And so our primary emphasis as we look at the word together this morning is on eating. Right? We're going to talk about food. Right? And some of you are like, finally, the pastor's going to talk about something I care about. Right? We're going to talk, we, we, as a people in general, we like to eat. Right? And I like to eat. And um, so in, within our passage, we got, we're going to look at 10 verses, and within those 10 verses, there's at least 10 references uh, to the idea of eating or feeding. Uh, in fact, there, there's even more allusions to that idea packed in there, right? So that's the big idea within our passage this morning. Uh, but what Jesus is going to say takes, takes the people listening by surprise. They're having a hard time grabbing a hold of this truth. And some of you this morning may have a hard time following along because Jesus is going to say some things that ultimately his disciples, when he's done saying, he says, these are hard things, Jesus. Right? Hard, to, hard to understand. Right? He's going to say, I, I am the bread of life and you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Right? Now you're saying, wait a minute. <laughs> we just took it, things to a different level. Right? We moved from eating to eating flesh and blood. What what are you talking about? What do you mean by that? And so that's what we want to, what we want to see, right? We want to unpack this idea and, and help us to understand what Jesus means when he says, if you want to live, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. All right, so let's read our passage. We'll have a, word, uh, have a word of prayer and we'll dig into this together this morning. Beginning in verse 48 of John chapter 6, uh, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning. Gracious Father, we give you thanks for the privilege we have of gathering together as your people, called by your name, saved by your grace. And now we come humbly before your word, asking that you would prepare our hearts to receive what you have for us. These truths are necessary and essential for us to understand, and yet they are not easy. And so I pray that you would grant us grace to hear your word clearly and plainly. I pray you might take this unworthy servant and use me for your glory this morning. We ask, O oh God, that through the proclamation of your word and the power of your spirit that you might accomplish your good purpose today. 
you might save the lost. You might sanctify your people. Lord, where, where conviction of sin is necessary, Lord, we pray that you would bring it about. Lord, where, where it is needed to comfort your saints, Lord, we pray that you would encourage and strengthen them through your word. Lord, always we ask that you might conform us more to the image of Christ. I pray these truths, Lord, would sink deep in our hearts, that we might have a, just a higher and clearer view of who Jesus is and what he has done as a result of our time together this morning. Lord, we ask that we might worship you together in the beauty of holiness. May this service have its way in your church. Purify and set us apart for your purpose here in the world. Lord, not only as we receive your word, but as we gather around your table, may we not do so in an unworthy manner. Oh, Lord, we ask these things this morning in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and amen. So we see Jesus' claim very clearly once again in verse 48, I am the bread of life. Not the first time we have seen that claim. Right, building off of the miracle he did at the beginning of the chapter when he fed the 5,000, the multitudes with some fish and, and some loaves of bread, but now coming back and making sense of the miracle. Right. What's the message in, in light of the miracle? I am the bread of life. Look back at verse 33. He said, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And talking to these people, he says, the true bread of God is he who comes down from heaven. Who is that? Well, we know, right, from John chapter 1. The Word, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But then he said in verse 14, the Word became flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. All right, so we're talking about Jesus here. Jesus come down from heaven, sent by God, true bread. And in verse 35, he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So this is the central theme of chapter 6, the first of several I am claims that Jesus will make in John's gospel. Right? He's going he's gonna to make these claims over and over again. I am. I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the vine. Right? We're going to see several of these as we march through John's gospel, but this is the first, and it's so vital that we grab a hold of it. Right? If, if we can get a hold of this truth, we'll understand what it means to be saved. And we'll also understand what it means for, for God to work sanctification in our life, to make us more and more like Jesus. All right, so we've touched on this big idea already. Right? Jesus is the only one who can satisfy our hungry souls. But Jesus now is going to press deeper into this truth, ultimately forcing a response. And we'll see the response next Sunday morning. But I want you to understand, you have to do something with this claim. Right? Jesus, Jesus does not leave the option to be ambivalent. Right? Nobody in the crowd is going to say, eh, I don't know what to do with that. Right? They, they're either going to reject Jesus as true bread, or they're going to accept him as true bread. And the same is true for you and I this morning. You can't sit back idly and not make a decision. Jesus puts forth this metaphor in such a way that it is life and death. Those who eat of this true bread, who eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, live forever, eternally. And those who reject, those who will not eat, die. Right? That's the clear message. And so to make the point, Jesus is going to walk back to something they've already brought up to him. Right? So in verses 49 and 50 in particular, he wants to turn their attention back to Moses and the people who were wandering in the wilderness. Now, they were the ones who brought it up earlier. Remember, they said, Moses gave us bread to eat. Jesus, why don't you do that again? Right? You gave us bread once, do it again, do it again, do it again. Jesus said, you just want your bellies full. Right? You don't understand the point. So he clarified for them, right? It wasn't Moses who gave you bread. It was my Father, right? It was God who gave true bread. And now he has sent me down, not as, right, the true manna, the true bread from heaven is 
Jesus. And so he clarifies that for them and gives a contrast in verse 49. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. Clear contrast, right? right? This is, even though God the Father sent manna to his people in the wilderness and it was sufficient to sustain and keep them for 40 years in the wilderness, it was only enough to sustain them physically. He says, they ate and they died. Right? Jesus now says, but... Those who eat of the bread that God has, right? Those who eat, like verse 50, the bread that comes down from heaven, they will eat of it and not die. And Jesus here is offering himself as the means to life. If you will eat of this true bread, you will live. Life and death, right? Now, what Jesus says next is really going to bring about how he's going to accomplish that. How is it that Jesus can give life, eternal life to us, people who are deserving of death? Are we not? If you can't nod and agree along with that, then you don't understand the gospel. Because the good news of the gospel is that Jesus came to die for our sins, and because we are sinners, we deserve death. We deserve hell. We deserve God's judgment. And there may be some of you sitting here going, Pastor, I mean... I understand I've done some bad things, but I'm not that bad. Right? I'm not hell bad. I'm not, I'm not God's judgment, condemnation bad. Well, then you don't understand the word rightly because we are all that bad. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All, right? The wages of sin is death. Not just physical death, but spiritual death. Separation from God forever and ever. So how is it that Jesus is going to say, I'm going to give you life? And that's what he says in verse 51. I am the living bread. Come down from heaven. I'm the one God sent into the world. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And then he says, the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is how Jesus is going to offer salvation. This is how he's going to give us life. Right? The wage of sin is death. He says, I'll give my flesh. I will die so you can live. That's what Jesus is saying. I'll give my flesh. Now, this language is not hard for them to understand in the sense that they're familiar with the language of sacrifice. They're familiar with the language of Passover, right? That there, is, there must be a sacrifice for sin. Right? So, so when they practice the Passover, they, they sacrifice a lamb, And then they eat of that lamb, right? The only difference here is Jesus is saying, remember what John said back in chapter 1? He pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. When Jesus says, right, this this bread that I offer is my flesh, he's saying I am that lamb. I'm the one who's going to give my life. I am the sacrifice for sin. I'm the one who's going to make it possible for any... He's, he's pointing forward to what he will do on the cross. We gather this morning and we're looking backwards, right? As we gather around the table and we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup, we are remembering what Jesus did on the cross for us, how he lived for us, how he died for our sin. But when Jesus says, the bread that I give is my flesh, he's telling them he's going to give his life. Right. This is the language of sacrifice. It's the language of substitution. How can Jesus save us from our sin and give us life? Because he takes our place. He takes the penalty that you and I deserve. And that's a glorious truth. <laughs> he who knew no sin became sin for us. And, and it says something of the incredible value of this sacrifice. Because Jesus here is able to offer himself and give salvation to many. Right? Remarkable, incredible value of the death of Christ. (laughs) Where he is going to give his flesh as a sacrifice for sin. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself 
bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. He bore our sins in his body. Do you see the language of substitution? The language of sacrifice? He says, the bread that I offer is my flesh. I'll die for your sin. Right, he's going to give himself. Now, in hearing this, the Jews in verse 52, they respond by saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Right, this is kind of hard to grab a hold of. They're having, you know, they understand the language of sacrifice, but they've never had somebody say, I'm going to die for you. Right? You eat my flesh. You, and, and, and he really intensifies it here. He says, so, so Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. What Jesus does is he ups the level, and in doing so, <laughs> the language he uses is radically offensive to the Jewish people. Right? Culturally, <laughs> right, they, they weren't have to do any, they weren't, they weren't supposed to have anything to do with blood, right? They weren't supposed to drink, they weren't even supposed to eat meat with blood in it. Right? So this is Levitical, Levitical law, right? Leviticus 19, they shouldn't mess with that stuff. And so when Jesus says, eat my flesh and drink my blood, right? it sounds like he's asking them to do something they should not do. And, I mean, taken quite literally, it sounds cannibalistic, right? <laughs> eat my flesh, drink my blood. And so, very offensive, and they're just struggling with what Jesus is saying. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? There's a lot of people there, right? They followed, he fed 15 to 20,000. They followed him to Capernaum. There's a lot of people there. They're arguing. How's this going to work out? I mean, he's, he's one man. There's a lot of us. Not enough to go around, right? And I don't, I don't, know, that, I don't know that they're taking this literally. I mean, you, you wouldn't think so. But they're having a hard time understanding what Jesus is saying. And maybe you are too. You're going, I don't know exactly what Jesus means by this. Right? Eat my flesh, drink my blood. And I think there's a, a couple of things we want to do right? to clarify what Jesus is saying. It's helpful for us to understand what he's not saying. All right? So number one, just to ease your conscience this morning, right? Jesus does not mean they should literally eat his flesh. Right? He's not endorsing cannibalism here. Right? In case you were wondering, Right? Some of you have got your kids kind of close by, like, I don't know if this is the right service to bring them to this morning. Right? So, so clearly, Jesus is speaking figuratively. Right? Eat my flesh, drink my, I am the bread of life. This is figurative language. You say, preacher, don't we take the Bible literally? Yes. Yes, we take the Bible literally. Right? And there, there's, a, there's ways we read the Bible, right? When it's plainly literally literal, we read it plainly literal. And when it's plainly figurative, we read it figurative. Make sense? Right? Jesus uses figurative language to communicate a literal truth here. Right? So if I said to you this morning, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Nobody thinks I'm having horse for lunch, right? You don't, you don't think that, right? That's, that's a figure of speech. Right? You know that. You're just saying, you're really hungry. Well, Jesus is using figurative language to communicate a literal truth. Eat my flesh and drink my blood does not mean that he really wants them to take a bite. Right? <laughs> But it is communicating a literal truth, and we need to understand what that is. And there's a second thing I want to make sure we understand. It's not saying, all right? So not, not endorsing cannibalism and not talking about communion, not talking about the Eucharist. Now, I know the language is similar. Right? Some of you are going, what, what are you talking about, right? I mean, Jesus said when he sat down with his disciples, this is my body, Right? This, is, this, this is my blood given for you. We read that in our scripture meditation this morning. But we have to understand, at this point, Jesus hasn't even instituted 
communion, right? The Lord's table hasn't, right, hasn't come about yet. So, and, and if we understand communion rightly, who's Jesus talking to primarily here? A big group of unbelievers, right? Is communion for unbelievers? What I say, you're welcome to participate if you have put your faith and trust. And communion is primarily for believers. If we take the language that Jesus uses here and say it applies to communion, then we've turned communion into a saving work. Because in eating and drinking, you get eternal life, which is what the Roman Catholic Church and others have done, right? They've said that it's necessary for you to participate in the Lord's table. It's necessary for you to take communion to get the saving effect of the work. To wish to the, they take it to the point where they say what? The bread becomes the actual body of Christ. And the cup that you drink of becomes the actual blood of Christ. We don't believe that. No. Right? Jesus is speaking figuratively here. Eat my flesh, drink my blood does not actually mean here. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. He's talking about his life and his death, right? And the benefits that he brings about through his life and his death. He is the bread of God come down from heaven. And Jesus lived a life unlike any other. A perfect, sinless life. Right? He lived on this sin-sick world, and he never sinned. Not in word, not in thought, not in deed. Unlike us, Jesus remained completely unspotted by the world. Right? He who knew no sin. Right? This is this is. Part of what makes him a suitable sacrifice, a perfect substitute for us. As the infinite Son of God come down from heaven perfectly holy, he is able to accomplish our salvation. When he talks about his blood, there's no time in the scripture where we're talking about blood. We're not talking about brutal death, right? Again and again in the Old Testament, we see these sacrifices, Right? The, the blood was shed, right? The Passover where they take the blood and, and they sprinkle it on the door. Right? Blood represents death. And when Jesus says, drink my blood, he's pointing them forward to his death where he will shed his blood on the cross. Without the shedding of blood, Hebrews 9.22 says, there is no forgiveness, no remission of sin. Not talking about, right? John chapter 6 is not talking about communion. Communion is talking about what happens in John chapter 6. Right? So as we gather around the table and we participate in communion, we are remembering the work of Jesus. We are remembering his life. We are remembering his death and all the benefits that were accomplished through that. But not the other way around. Right? This is not talking about actually taking communion. So what is it talking about? That's what you're wanting, right? <laughs> When we cover what it doesn't say, what does it say? What does Jesus mean when he says in verse 53, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Right? Life and death, right? Unless you do this, no life. And so this is where we're going to just take the metaphor and we're going to try and apply it. Right? We like to eat, right? We enjoy eating. But primarily, eating is what? It is essential. Right? I mean, we enjoy it, but it's necessary. It's necessary for life. And so this is the, the first and most basic understanding of what Jesus is saying. Spiritually speaking, it is necessary to feed on Jesus for eternal life. Right? So, so that's the first thing we understand. Right? We know that food is necessary for life. You must eat to live. And so spiritually speaking, Jesus is saying you must eat of the Lord Jesus Christ if you're going to have eternal life. If you do not eat of Jesus Christ, you have no life. It's that significant. Now you're going, okay, pastor, I get the point. I see how important it is, but how do you do that? Right? How do you eat of Christ? How do you eat of his flesh? And how do you drink of his blood? Well, Jesus has already told us. 
right? <laughs> Within the context of the passage. Now, he continues to press the metaphor deeper as they grumble and they argue. But, but let's, let's look at the contrast. So verse 54, all right, look at your Bibles carefully here. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood, that's that hard language we're wrestling with, has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. All right. Say, so, well, what, what does that mean? Well, let's go back to verse 40. All right. Go back to verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Do you see? The, the correlation is so plain and so clear. He's already told them what it means to eat and drink. To eat and drink of his flesh and blood is a figurative way of saying, look on me, believe on me, trust in me. Right? That's what he's saying. Right? To, to believe in Jesus. And that is the highlight, pinnacle point of the Gospel of John, right? That you may believe that he is the Son of God. And in believing, have life. Right. So Jesus uses this figurative language, but he's making it plain. Right? What it means to eat and drink his blood is just saying, if you want life, believe in me. Believe in that I am the bread of God. Right? I have come down from heaven. I am the Son of God. Come to earth lived the perfect sinless life, died a substitutionary death in your place as a sacrifice for your sin. Right? You believe in who Jesus is, and you believe in what he has done, and he says if you do that, you'll have life. Early church father Augustine said, believe and you have eaten. Believe and you have eaten. Right? So if you're going, how do I do that? Well, you believe. You believe in Jesus. And so that's the essential question, right? First and foremost, have you believed in Jesus Christ? Have you eaten of his flesh, drank of his blood? Because this is life and death. Spiritually speaking, you have no spiritual life in you if you have not believed on Jesus. Have you trusted in him alone? Right? So that's number one. Then secondly, I would say this. When we think about this metaphor, you have to actually eat it. <laughs> you know, what do you mean? I thought you just said this is believe. Yes. But again, we see in verse 53, unless you eat the flesh, unless you drink his blood, you have no life in you. All right. So, yes, food is essential for life, but you actually have to eat the food for it to accomplish the benefits. Now, we have, over the last couple of years, we've kind of become a little more conscious of what we eat. And, and my wife is really good at kind of tracking what she eats. I'm not so good at that. Right? But she, she keeps track. So a lot of times in the morning, I'll get up and I'll smell her breakfast. Right? Eggs, bacon, protein waffle, because you've got to be careful with the carbohydrates, right? So... There's, the, there's bacon and, and syrup, sugar-free syrup, and, and eggs, and it all smells so good. And so she sits down with her breakfast, and she's got her tracker, and she tracks. She's got this incredible smelling breakfast, and she knows everything that's in it, right? I mean, every, every little thing that's in that breakfast, she knows it all. Now, what good does it do? if she sets that plate down and walks away and doesn't eat it? Absolutely not. She knows everything that's in it. Right? She experienced the smell of it, and yet she misses the benefits unless she actually eats. And so when Jesus uses the metaphor, we've got to understand what he's saying here. You actually have to take me in if you're going to experience the benefits of my life and death. It's not enough just to know all these things. And a lot of people do, right? Some of you know, you know all about Jesus because you've grown up in church and you've been around these, just like this people here, right? They saw Jesus. They experienced the miracles. They heard his word. 
They know all about him, but they haven't eaten and they haven't drank. And some of you have been around this truth your whole life and you can take the gospel quiz and you can check every box and you know all the truth, but you've never actually eaten and drank for yourself. You walk away week after week. And it's no worse than just walking away from a, a beautiful plate of food, right? You don't get the benefits unless you actually trust in Christ for yourself. Christ alone. Right? This is key to understanding the metaphor. And I would say this as well. You must actually eat. Right? Right? I, can't, I can't call home to my wife. Or there's times where I'm studying and things are going, you know, things are going, and it's lunchtime. Like, man, things are going really well right now and I'm so busy. Hey, honey, can you just go ahead and eat lunch for me today? Right? I, 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 yeah, I would never say that, by the way. <laughs> She knows I'd never say that. I don't skip a meal. But she can't do that, right? She can't eat lunch for me. Well, if we press this metaphor a little deeper, right, no one can eat and drink of Christ for you. It, it is a personal, right? You must believe in him yourself. It doesn't matter who grandma and grandpa are. It doesn't matter who mom and dad are. It doesn't matter if you've grown up in a Christian home Right? You, yourself, must trust and believe in Christ alone if you are going to be saved. Right? It's personal. Right? No one can do this for you. You must eat and drink or you have no life in you. Now as we press this forward a little more and we dig deeper into this, in verse 55, Jesus says, He says, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Now, we understand eating and drinking is in response to a, a felt need, right? right? Here in a little bit, when I stop preaching, my, my stomach's going to start growling every Sunday in Sunday school, right? every single week. My, my stomach starts growling, and I'm ready for, I'm ready for more food. <laughs> I'm trained well. <laughs> but Jesus says what? See, is we eat in response to that desire, that need. And, and so spiritually speaking, we need to understand when Jesus says, I am true food and I am true drink, he is saying, I and I alone can satisfy your spiritual hunger. No one else. Now the world does a, it does a real good effort at trying to offer you all kinds of things that say, I'll satisfy you. I'll, I'll give you your delight. I'll give you your joy. Right? For some of us, eating is a, a great delight, right? right. <laughs> a couple weeks ago on Father's Day, my wife made me uh, ribeye steak and baby back ribs. Right. So you go, Pastor, that's not even right. right. Why are you talking about that right now? Right. I mean, just every bite, right? You're just, man, it's so good. There's, there's delight in, in eating. And here he's saying, I am true food. I'm the one who will really satisfy. I'm the one who will really, truly delight your soul. And again, we have an enemy who will offer us all kinds of things. And we live in a sinful world that throws all kinds of things our way. We talked about this a few weeks ago, right? That but it bears mentioning again, right? There's things that we think are good that will give us satisfaction, but they never will. We may think there are certain relationships. Maybe they're sinful relationships that will satisfy, but they won't. Right? If, if you're seeking satisfaction in a person, the only person that will really satisfy you is Christ. And if you're seeking satisfaction in a sinful relationship outside the bonds of marriage... Right? You think, man, that's, that's what will ultimately make me happy. It won't make you happy. Right? Money and material things, power and possessions will not make you happy. Why? Because Jesus is true food and true drink. Right? And some of you have never come to that realization, right? And you need to eat and drink for the first time ever. You need to taste and see that the Lord is good. But there are many of us as his people Right? who we are dabbling around with other things. 
And the real, true joy and satisfaction is Christ. See, it's not only the power to save, but the power to, to sanctify, right? As his people, we are saying, Jesus is better. I want him more than I want anything else. So, that, so when we sin, we're saying, I want that more than I want him. And Jesus is saying, no, I'm true food. I'm true drink, right? Whoever, whoever, back to verse 35, whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Are you delighting in Christ, brothers and sisters? Now, there's, a, there's a shift here in the language as you're reading through. Beginning in verse 54 through verse 58, Jesus changes the verb, right? He's talking about eating and eating, and then all of a sudden he switches to feeding, right? From eating to feeding. You say, what happens here? Well, Jesus just intensifies the language, right? He moves to present tense, active. This is an ongoing thing. So yes, we are saved by believing, trusting in Christ, but it doesn't stop, right? We continue to believe and trust in him. We walk by faith and not by sight. And so Jesus presses further into this truth, just amplifying the need for us as his people to spiritually feed on Christ. We come to him and we keep on coming. We keep on coming. And like, right, like the inexhaustible feeding of the fire, right? He just keeps coming until they were satisfied. Right? We keep coming to Christ and he keeps satisfying it. It never stops. Never stops. One more picture here in verse 56. Jesus says, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood, abides in me, and I in him. Right. So when you, when you take food in, it becomes a, a part of you, right? And all the, the benefits of that go throughout you in different ways. Well, Jesus here is saying, right, when, whenever you feed on me, whenever you believe on me, you're united with me. Right? There's this incredible union that takes place. You take him in, and he is in you. This is talking about the union of Christ. And we just continue to become more and more like him. What verse 56 is saying is essentially what we see in Galatians 2.20. Right? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. Right? So we have this incredible union when we, by faith, feast upon the benefits of Christ. He comes into us as his people. Right? This is something we should think deeply about. Christ in me. Right? So, so the implication here is what? That we should eat often, that we should continue to feast on Christ day after day after day. How do we do that? How do you feed on Christ? Well, you believe, right? You believe, right? So something we say often around here, preach the gospel to yourself every day. Remind yourself of these truths. And yes, Dig into the Word of God. I was greatly encouraged this week by the amount of you who are, you've, hang in, you've hung in with the Bible reading. Right? There's so many of you, right? We're halfway through. And a good deal, is some of you are going, oh, I fell off the, that's okay. Pick up, right? The key is what? Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word to proceed from the mouth of God. You want to feed on Christ? Christ is in this Word, and we dig into it, and we see more of who He is, and we trust Him more deeply. So day after day after day, we feed on him by believing by, that, that he is sufficient, that he is enough to save, but he is enough to satisfy my life. No matter what's going on, no matter what hurt, no matter what pain, no matter what storms you're facing, Jesus is enough. His love is enough. His grace is enough. His presence is enough. His promises are enough. And you believe that. Are you feasting? Are you feeding on Christ day after day? Oh, the hymn writer, right? 
prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. So you're like, preacher, I know these things are true, but that's not true of me. I don't live that way. And I would say that as a follower of Christ, if you are not feeding on him, you're in danger. You're vulnerable. The means of grace that God has given us to the the realities of the gospel, the the word of God, the gathering of the saints of his people, right? depending upon him in prayer. If, If these things are not part of your daily life, your regular spiritual life, then you are in danger. Now, I, I think you know, I'm not saying that we do those things, we can be saved. Right? But these are the means of grace that God has given us to sanctify and to satisfy us day in and day out. And ultimately, he, just, he, he concludes where he, kind of with this main point, in verse 57 and 58, as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. That's the big, big idea, right? Main point. Whoever feeds on me will live forever. Whoever. Right? We said last week, that's your Bible name, right? This is the open invitation, the free offer of the gospel. Whoever believes, whoever feeds, whoever eats of his body, whoever drinks of his blood, whoever, if you will believe in Christ, you will live for eternity. And maybe you're saying, preacher, I know lots of Christians and and they died. Oh, but we believe the promises of the word, right? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? And, and one day, what does he say in verse 40? In verse 54, I will raise him up on the last day. Not the end of the story, right? All who are in Christ will be raised. New glorified bodies to be with him forever and ever and ever. And when we've been there 10,000 years, bright, shining as the sun, with no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Right? right? When we eat and drink, when we believe in Christ, we live forever. And so that is the big question this morning. Have you believed in Jesus? Have you trusted in Christ alone for your salvation? Not in your goodness, not in anything, not, not in going to church, right? not in doing good things, We'll see next week. He's going to be just very clear and plain. The flesh is of no use at all. We have nothing to offer him. But just saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. My only hope is Christ and his work on the cross. Have you believed in him? If not, don't take offense, but you have no life. No life in you. No spiritual life in you. And the Bible says you will perish in your sin. And you will experience the judgment that we talked about. And regardless of what you think of yourself and how you esteem yourself, if you say, Pastor, I'm not that bad. I'm not hell bad. I'm not judgment bad. It doesn't change the truth of the word of God. That if you're going to experience life, you must believe in Christ alone. Brothers and sisters, as we close this morning, are you feeding on Christ? Are you feasting on the benefits of his life and death? In just a moment, we're going to gather together around the Lord's table. Again, what's happening here in John 6 is not communion, but communion reminds us of what happens here in John 6, that Jesus lived and died For us, as we eat of that bread and we drink of that cup, we proclaim his death until he comes. And because of all that it represents, 
it is vital that we do not come before this table in an unworthy manner. So if there's unconfessed sin in your life, now is the time to deal with that. Unrepentant sin, if there's things in your life that should not be there, right now I'm going to give you opportunity. We're just going to have a moment of quiet, an opportunity for you to examine your own heart before the Lord. Psalm, Psalm 123 says, Search me, O God. And see if there be any wicked way in me. Search me, O God. May that be our prayer as we quietly go before his throne this morning. So a moment of quiet, and then I'll have the men come and help me serve this morning.